So you notice I didn't uh, immediately confirm to Joel that we were studying Ephesians today. <laughs> we read from Ephesians as our scripture reading because that sets the, the tone of what we're talking about. But today I, I am really not going to be preaching a sermon. Today is going to be a full participation service. When has that ever happened that we've done this on a Sunday morning? So let me just kind of explain to you why I'm doing this and what it's going to look like so that you can enter into it in the fullest possible way. <clears throat> Sometimes learning things comes not from the pulpit, but comes from one another. And we are beginning a study, and I'm hoping and praying for a great deal of hope and change in the way we function as families. Not only as individual families that come together here to worship, but as a big family that worships within this room. I want you to understand what is God's plan. I want us to conform as best we can to his plan. And I want also for us to be able to know how to function within the structures that we presently are experiencing. For we are really a varied group. It's a family of so many kinds of backgrounds, so many different kinds of experiences. And so part of the service today is going to be a little bit of sharing from you. I, I'm warning you that for this, and this scares me to death, okay? So this is an act of faith on my part, all right? I have faith in you. I have faith in God. I've been before his throne about this a lot lately. That I, I want you to be able to talk in a large room with a lot of people, but about things that really, truly matter to you, okay? So be prepared. Think about this and say, okay, Lord, repeat after me. I will do what you say. I will do what you say. Okay, a little bit of manipulation there. I apologize for that. But it makes me feel better if I hear you say it. <clears throat> after all, you did say whatever you said, Lord, I will do. <clears throat> so... I want to talk to you about a little bit about the changes that are happening in the family these days and the structures of families and the challenges that that brings to us and how we live our lives. And then I'm going to have John Herb talk about his family that he came from, that he's part of. And I'm going to ask Mike Haynes to also talk about his family. These are two different kinds of families. John comes, well, you'll hear about it when they tell you about them. <clears throat> to ye generations ago. Um, let me finish what I'm talking about, what we're going to do. All right, so we're, after they do what they're going to do, that, then I'm going to ask you, for you to just stand wherever you are and tell us how your family structure is different from what they described as theirs, okay? How is yours different? I don't want you to, to be sharing your, all your dirty laundry. I don't want any of your dirty laundry. I just want you to say to me something like, well, in our family right now, it's just the two of us, and we're taking care of mom, okay? That would be one kind of family structure. Another may be, you know what? I am living alone now. I was doing a family thing, but now I'm all alone. That is where I am. You might want to talk just a little bit about where it came from, if that is something that has had a large impact in your life. Like, for instance, I'm the product of a, of a, a divorce of my parents, <clears throat> and that brought about a great deal of... Uh, of th uh, things for me to face and things for me to, to handle. Don't need to go into a whole lot of details, but let's, my point in having you do that is so that we might be able to look across the congregation and say, you know what? There's a great variety here. And there are some things that I've heard today that give me reason to pray for these people. 
If we're to function together as a body of believers, it's very important that we know each other. And many of us come here on a Sunday morning, we hear a sermon, we sing songs, and then we read the scriptures, and then we leave. And we don't talk to anyone, or we may talk to just the same people each time, but there's a whole vast group of people you have no idea about. And I think it's going to be so vital for the success of these series of sermons on the family that we are praying for each other, each other's family structure, whatever that might be. So you can't pray if you don't know. And people can't pray for you if they don't know what you're going through. What are your challenges? And how is that affecting your life? So there will be a time for us to talk about that. Depending if I stop talking, there may even be some time before we quit. But uh, then I'm going to ask you to pray. We're going to have a time of prayer this morning. I know this is not a prayer meeting, but one of the things that we have shared with you as part of our core values as a church is that we value prayer, and we believe that God answers prayers. I've had a number of answers to prayer this week that have thrilled me to the bone. And I believe that God will work if we will ask him. So it's very important that we pray together as a whole family. And so I'm going to ask you once again, God, whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to do it. I want to ask you to have the nerve to stand where you are and pray for whatever it is God lays on your heart for this family. That's where our service is going to be like today. Howard is going to let you do the talking, and then I'll pick it up next week. But today, we're going to be sharing, getting to know each other about where we are, and I know that's a little threatening for some of you, and I'm asking you to just take that little step of courage so that we might be able then to pray for you and uh, care about your situation. Let me just preliminary some of these things by saying this. Two, years, two generations ago, a typical family, American family, consisted of a father, a mother, three or four children. In contrast, in a recent survey that asked respondents to what constitutes a family, a woman in her 60s wrote the following. My boyfriend and I have lived together with my youngest son for several years. However, our family, with whom we spend holidays and special events, also includes my ex-husband and his wife and child, my boyfriend's ex-mother-in-law and her sister, his ex-wife and her boyfriend, my oldest son, who lives with on his own, my mom and stepfather, and my stepbrother and his wife, and their biological child, and their adopted child, and big sister child. Needless to say, introductions to outsiders are confusing. <laughs> I get that. Do you get that? Yeah. The traditional family. In, in, the, in, the, in the society in which we're living, the husband... If the, in which the husband is the breadwinner and the wife is the full-time homemaker, well, has declined from 60% of all U.S. families in 1972 to 29% in 2007. That was a while back, but still, the change is significant and instructive. Almost 19 million American singles, ages 30 to 44, have never been married representing 31% of all the people in that age group. Today, the median age of first marriage is higher than at any time since 1890. 27 and a half years old for men and 25 and 0.6 years for women. On average, on average, first marriages that end in divorce last about eight years. That's all. The percentage of children under age 18 living with two married parents fell from 77% to 67% in 2008. 
single parent American households increased from 11% of all households in 1970 to 30% in 2007. I'm reading to you statistics that came from a sociologist online. And he says, there is no universal definition of the family because contemporary household arrangements are complex. Traditionally, family has been defined as a unit made up of two or more people who are related by blood, marriage, or adoption, live together, form an economic unit, and bear and raise children. The U.S. Census Bureau defines the family simply as two or more people living together who are related by birth, marriage, or adoption. But many social scientists have challenged such traditional definitions because they exclude a number of diverse groups that are also consider themselves families. Like they said, what about child-free couples families? What about cohabiting couples? Foster parents and their charges? Elderly sisters living together? Gay and lesbian couples with or without children? grandparents raising grandchildren. The definitions for families have changed. For our purposes, says this particular sociologist, a family is an intimate group of two or more people who live together in a committed relationship and care for one another and any children and share activities and close, match, uh, close emotional ties. Some people may disagree with this definition because it doesn't explicitly include marriage or procreation or child rearing, but it is more inclusive than the traditional views of a wide variety of family forms. Now, definitions of family may become even more complicated and more controversial in the future. As reproductive technology advances, a baby might have several parents. An egg donor, a sperm, a sperm donor, a woman who carries the baby during the pregnancy, and the couple who intends to raise the child. Good, great. <clears throat> if that's not confusing enough, the biological father may be dead for years but by the time the child is actually conceived because his sperm can be frozen and then stored. Wow, we are facing a lot of changes a lot of things going on in our society. How do we respond to these? If these, ref if these viewpoints bring concern to your hearts, you're not alone. I believe that we should be concerned along two lines. First, I believe that we should be concerned enough to know that the, ch the changes that are occurring around us and know what they are and what effects they're having in people's lives. And secondly, to know how to respond to those changes in a way that reflects the love of Christ and promotes God's plan for families around us, especially among families within the church. And so today we'll focus briefly on what exists here in our family, how it's impacting our lives. And then we are going to go before God and pray and it will help us to know how to respond to the structures that we have. We've talked about different changes that have come about in our society within this kind of structure. Some of those changes are good. Some of them are perfectly natural. Some of them are not good and unnatural. So when we talk about having these kinds of changes and that our family is not what ordinarily families look like or what we used to be back years ago, it's not necessarily saying that that's a bad thing or that's something that has to change or something that you know uh, we need to be ashamed of, but that's, that's where we are. And you know, it can be like, for instance, there was a, a husband and a wife and three children and those kids are now married and moved on. And if that's the case, that's a good thing. That's what we want them to do. That's, but it's a change, and it's something that we deal with and something that brings about changes in our lives. Sometimes it comes about as a result of moving. We have people in our congregation that have moved here from very far away. We have some people who come from Belarus, others who have come from Korea, others who have come from India, and, and their family structure, the, the, the nuclear family, has been separated by such a huge difference, distance. 
and do. And sometimes, you know, you're a young couple here and a married family here, and your, your mom's having a problem out there in, in a far, far distant land, and, and you want to do something for her, but you can't because, well, it's just so far away. And who has the money to be able to travel and to stay there for a long period of time and, and things like that come about? So there's a lot of yearning, a lot of longing for wanting to be where you couldn't be or cannot be. And those are things that we are facing here in this family too. I've asked John Herbert to come and share with us. When he and I and, and Joel were t spending time talking about this service, I just asked him to share with me what was their family experience. Well, I don't know if I had heard it before or not, but I, I was a little bit stunned when I heard that John was one of 12 children. And that's a rather large family. How many of you come from large families like that? Yeah, okay, there's a, there's a few, but very few. So that's a unique relationship that he's had all his life. And I'd like us to hear about what is that like. And then uh, I'm going to ask Mike come and share his experience too. So John, come and talk. <clears throat> Let me tell you a little bit about the Herb family. My parents, neither of my parents, my mother or my father, came from a Christian background. And they had four sons when they came to know the Lord. And of course, coming to know the Lord radically changed their life. And they believed from reading the scriptures that children were a gift from the Lord. And so they had eight more children. Seven boys and five girls. I spent most of my life in a three-bedroom home. Now, if you think about that, we had a men's room, a girl's room, and my parents' room. So in, in the boys' room or the men's room, we had anywhere from five to seven people who shared uh, that room. One of the things about growing up in a large family is that you never really, never had to look for someone to play with. There was always lots of people around. There were always lots of things uh, that were going on. And so you learn to interact with other people. You learn give and take. And growing up, I learned a lot about responsibility and work. How do you raise 12 children? Well, the older children help to raise the younger children. And all of us, of course, had work responsibilities. I can remember for about four years that I had the responsibility uh, every Friday night of taking steel wool, scrubbing all of the black marks off the kitchen floor, then washing it down, and then waxing it before I would go to bed at night. And then my brother Leroy and I had the responsibility for three or four years when my sisters got older of doing the dishes. Well, when you wash the dishes for, you know, 12 to 14 people, that's like an hour and a half work. So I've washed enough dishes and washed enough floors to last me the rest of uh, my life. Uh, how, do, how do you support that kind of a family? Well, we worked hard and we worked together as a family. We had a large garden which we worked in and raised our, our own fruit, food more or less. And then, of course, we did jobs on the side between the employment that my father had. And I can remember as a kid, we would go out and we would wallpaper rooms. And all of the kids, we had little steel spatulas. We'd take the old wallpaper off and clean up. And my older brother, Jack, and my dad would hang the wallpaper. My mom, of course, would paste all of the paper. And back in those days, we wallpapered for $2.50 a room. So it was a pretty good, a pretty good deal. Now, uh, uh, one of the other things I could mention that uh, enabled my parents to survive was up until the time I left home uh, to go to college, I and all of my brothers and sisters gave two-thirds of our income home. We began to work as soon as we were able to work, and of course we helped to meet the needs of the family in that way. One of the things about my family is that uh, my parents' relationship to the Lord was the most important thing uh, in their life. It was a dominant factor in everything that we did. And of course, their commitment to the church and the people of God 
uh, was the top priority in their life. It had preeminence over everything. I can remember on Wednesday nights when I played in Little League having to go up and tell the coach that I had to go home early because I needed to be at prayer meeting. You know, it was a top priority. Well, that leaves an influence upon your life when you know what's important to your parents. My parents not only taught us the gospel, but they lived the gospel, and we saw it demonstrated in their lives in every way. They taught us at home. We did have family altar. And one of the things I'll say, we live right in the middle of the city, and our not only we have a lot of our own family there, but our, our house was a drawing place for all of the kids in the neighborhood. They would hang around at our house. Maybe their parents weren't at home, I don't know. But they came to our house, and I can remember over and over again having maybe four or five neighbor kids sitting out in the back porch waiting for us to finish with family devotions so before we could go out and play whatever we were going to do and play uh, baseball whatever it was. We had our own baseball team, our own basketball team, <laughs> our own football team. We had everything. So growing up in a family was, a, was something that I would uh, never change for anything else. So I'm one of tw 12 children and I'm here this morning to give testimony to the tremendous influence of my parents. And uh, I can tell you this morning that every one of my brothers and sisters, all 12 children, are actively serving the Lord. Thank you, John. <clears throat> John uh, and Nancy uh, went to the funeral of his one of his brothers, Ray, this week. Um, you know, a difficult time, different cold experience, but one of great hope and, and joy. One of the things that John told me was that uh, it was his brothers that really drew him to Christ. And uh, it was his brothers who really influenced his beliefs uh, concerning God as they spent time and kept feeding him books uh, to read. So really kind of a special thing. Mike, come share with us uh, the uh, different experience uh, in which the Lord brought him to himself. <clears throat> Nolan? Um, <clears throat> so Pastor Howard asked me yesterday to... Uh, <laughs> 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 um, you know, overnight, and I'm thinking about, uh, you know, how... Um, I guess I could start out, the simple version would be... Uh, Marriage good, divorce bad, right? And uh, <laughs> I saw this sign over here on Valley Forge Road in front of a church. It said, uh, we're called to be witnesses, not judges and lawyers in front of a church. And uh, the, the tremendous teaching that I've received here is uh, when you're called upon to respond and get involved, it encourages uh, fellowship and, and, and teaching and, uh, and, and spiritual and Christian growth. So... Uh, uh, that's what I'm going to attempt to do is kind of explain uh, what the, the effect. I, and in a lot of ways, I thought that this was in the past and I had coped with it and accepted it. And, uh, and uh, it was just kind of a, uh, uh, something that happened in life that uh, I was just expected to deal with and, and move past. And I went through different uh, times in my life where it meant different things. And it, uh, it, it, it made me think deeply and ask questions and prompted me to get answers. Um, so I, I guess a picture of my family uh, was of my mother and father. They they divorced when I was, or separated when I was in my older teens and, and ultimately, inevitably divorced in my early 20s. So there was, if you saw a picture of our family, uh, you saw from about 15 years of really trying to work on a marriage and trying to... Uh, uh, work it out and uh, have hope uh, through the challenges and the struggles. Um, um, neither of my parents were Christians and understood salvation, although we went to Catholic Church, but we didn't read the Bible and we weren't taught about salvation. We didn't have intimate relationships with Jesus and, and, and understanding as far as I could, uh, uh, that I know it now. But I could see the Holy Spirit welling up and, and working in ways through my life before I became a believer. And if you saw these pictures of our family, we were really trying and, and uh, there was a lot of... Uh, 
a lot of happiness and a lot of uh, 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 family, uh, a lot of good times and a lot of uh, our parents watched out over us, provided for us and uh, kept us together. There was a lot of encouragement and there was a lot of optimism. But then if you saw a shot about seven years later, you saw, uh, and I had a picture, and I, and I would, had it with me for a while, and then uh, I lost it or put it somewhere, and then I got it. So I go through these different phases of, uh, of thinking about this. It's a picture of my parents on one of their last vacations. And you could see the, the emotion on my mom's face and the, the, the kind of a, an, an optimistic hopelessness on, on the expression and a sheer discouragement on my father's face. And, and it was one of the last pictures of my parents parents together and, and I kind of held on to that. And uh, I remember uh, times with my father, we grew up over here on Franklin Street, we had a house, and uh, sitting in the garage watching uh, thunderstorms come by and, and torrential downpours and just watching the rain and just marveling and amazed that, you know, everything outside stopped when the rain came or else you got drenched and you went inside and you waited and watching the lightning and hearing the thunder and, you know, being eight years old and, you know, and, uh, and, and, and I remember like fast, a, a couple of years Years later, sitting down on the steps, and my father would ask me, "You know, what do you think? I do? What, what should I do about this? This is such a challenge." And I remember thinking, uh, "You know, these were these were marital problems that he was going through, and relationship issues, and and and, and they were serious." And I remember thinking. Uh, Gee, Dad, I'm just a kid, you know. And what do you, <laughs> what do you expect from me? I'm glad that you appreciate my opinion, but you know, <laughs> and, and 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 made me think about how so much we're on the receiving end as children. No matter what happened, we had to cope with it the best we could and figure our way through it. So I more or less gave them the benefit of the doubt and let them try to work through it. But it, but it was only until when I became a believer, and I, and I I don't know if. New believers go right to the Bible and say, well, what does God say about divorce? It's like, it, it seemed like it was a big thing to find out exactly what the ultimate absolute authority on everything says about divorce. And, and I remember thinking about my parents, like, you know, you, you challenge the Word of God here, you know? And, and in many ways, uh, had you persevered, uh, you, you could have made it through, because as far as I understood the issues, they weren't anything that wasn't overcomable. And, uh, but you know, eventually, inevitably, they got a divorce. I had a, uh, uh, my dad moved out with my sisters, and my older sister went to college. So the house was empty, and it hadn't been sold yet. And I remember walking down the hallway, uh, past the bedrooms, and just hearing the echo in the room that you know the furniture was gone, and the reality that it was right in front of me that you know this house was going to be sold. So an incredible sense of uh, you know independence came over me and my sisters, where it was kind of sink or swim. You you there there wasn't a whole lot of room for error in terms of plan B, you know, and, and uh, both my parents got remarried and they were married longer the second time than they were the first time. So that introduces a lot of other people in my life. There's uh, stepbrothers and sisters and, and uh, stepmother and father. So learning how to navigate this, I remember being in high school. Uh, pointing out who my new stepbrother and stepsisters were going to be and not even realizing that they existed at North Penn there were you know 3000 kids but I'm like they weren't even in my circle of friends you know I didn't even know who these people were and now all of a sudden they're grafted into my family so I, I felt obligated you know and 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 uh, to try to make it work and to try to get along and um, so as the uh, you know, Christmases, birthdays, and, and I would say that of the two people that I know personally in my life that have the most animosity towards each other is my own mom and dad. Even to this day, when we make arrangements for Christmas and we make arrangements for to, to have them over, they really can't stay in the same room together for too long without, there's always this underlying tension. And and, uh, and I've never been able to really figure it out, but I, even before I became a believer, I think I turned it over to the Lord and I said, you know, this obviously is not gonna be resolved and reconciled until way into the future, you know? and it's. Given me a sense of hope that you know this 
I have a lot to learn in the future about how this situation could be resolved, but I've learned to accept it and move on and, and, uh, and, and I suppose make the best of it. But there's been lots of challenges, logistical challenges, birthdays, uh, family gatherings, and, and a lot of questions. So the Holy Spirit, even before a believer, welled up in me to, 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 to think about how important it was to make an effort and persevere and to try to establish a family and, and, and do whatever it took to keep the family together. It was just an, an inherent, innate, important value that I had as a result. But it, it wasn't anything traumatic. That, that, that happened, and, and, and there was certainly, like I say, a lot of underlying tension and turmoil. We were always kind of resolving crises rather than building towards a common goal. It was always like, well, we got past that, you know, and this kind of uneasy feeling that the rug was always going to be pulled, at some point going to be pulled out from underneath you. So I, I kind of think back and wish that I could have had more of a stable environment to grow up in. But like like I said, I haven't really obsessed about or thought about it that much, but it's it's definitely a dynamic that is that is uh, you know attributed to uh, you know uh, the, the life as I have now. So, thank you. You see why I did not need to tell him earlier than last night. <laughs> So I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place because uh, we could share a whole lot more and then we wouldn't have any time to pray. And I, I really want, I want us to pray. Um, I think we've had enough just to listen to this and you can extrapolate a little bit more. We'll hear from more people as, as weeks go on. Um, but you can extrapolate, you know, what are the, the challenges and the blessings that can come from a family. And uh, we want to pray for those blessings and we want to pray for ways in which we might learn how to cope. As Mike shared some really very wonderful ways in which he learned to cope uh, with the things that were happening in his life. And I think we want to learn how to do that too because many of us can't change the arrangement that we're in. And so we want to know how to respond to it in a way that really honors God. And so we'll be talking about that. So we're going to take a moment now to, uh, we've got five minutes left, and uh, I want to devote that to prayer. And we're not going to microphone anybody, but it, it, that means that if you're going to pray, please lift your voice so that other people can hear you. We want to pray uh, earnestly for God's working. So I'm going to uh, uh, just let you pray individually. Try not to pray a long prayer so that other people can pray too. Uh, but say what you want to say. Ask God what you're, for what you're really concerned for. And then in uh, a little while, I'll close. All right, let's bow together before God. <clears throat>